All right, hello everyone. Welcome to our Civil War Institute Summer Conference Preview Series. My name is Cameron Sowers. I'm a senior history major at Gettysburg College and I'm a fellow at the Civil War Institute. Today, I'm very excited to be joined by Dr. Keith Bohannon, a history professor at the University of West Georgia. Dr. Bohannon got his PhD from Penn State in 2001 and has published a lot of different articles and essays for edited collections and scholarly journals. Our conference attendees are gonna recognize Dr. Bohannon from some of his previous presentations at the Civil War Institute Conference. This summer, Dr. Bohannon is slated to give a tour on SEMS Brigade for this summer's conference tours that focus on our battlefield to field hospital theme. Dr. Bohannon, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Kim. Um, so my first question for you, before we get into talking about SEMS Brigade, I actually wanna to touch briefly on your experience working as a public historian, because that's gonna come into play for your tour this week. So I'm just wondering what drew you to working as an interpreter and what your experience in the field of public history was like? Sure. Uh, as a teenager, I grew up outside Atlanta um, on Civil War battlefields and, um, and started working as a volunteer at Kennesaw Mountain, which is only about 10, it's a national battlefield park about 10 miles from where I live. And I really enjoyed doing public interpretation, uh, serving on the cannon crew there and doing living history programs. And when I turned 18, I had the opportunity to um, to become a seasonal historian with the Park Service. And as you probably know, a lot of national parks hire summer seasonal staff. And so I uh, started as a seasonal at Fredericksburg in Spotsylvania uh, and worked and loved it so much. I worked there for 11 summers um, and, uh, and enjoyed it immensely. Uh, and I still have a lot of close ties with the Park Service. I volunteer uh, to give talks at um, and tours at various parks. And some of my closest friends work at, in the National Park Service. So, um, yeah. No, that's great. So um, I'm just curious. So your tour is going to be talking about SEMS Brigade in McClaw's division, uh, all Georgia men. Uh, I'm assuming that's how you got interested in SEMS Brigade with your Georgia ties, but I'm curious the kind of the roots of your interest there. Yeah, uh, again, um, my interest in the Civil War dates back to my teen years. I had a ge uh, genealogy assignment in, in middle school, actually, where we were supposed to uh, trace our family tree. And um, in the course of doing that, I discovered I had my both sides of my family have been from Georgia forever. And I found out I had uh, ancestors who'd served in the Confederate Army. And so ever since then, I've been uh, fascinated with the Civil War, Southern history, and particularly my home state of Georgia and its role in the war. So, uh, and you're right, uh, the brigade commanded by Paul Sims was one composed of, um, of all Georgia regiments. So I've um, I spent a lot of time, uh, a couple of decades actually, uh, pulling together source material just because I enjoy it. And I also use it in my scholarship. And I I'm always happy to help out other scholars who have an interest in the topic too and, and send them source material. That was a question I had at the end, but I'm going to bump it up to now. Like, All if right. you have um, about your source material and working, because sure. you, you know this brigade inside and out, if you have a favorite diary or letter collection or a favorite kind of source that you like to go to uh, when you're working with SEMS Brigade or something that's struck you and stayed with you, I'm just kind of sure. curious what you found that's particularly interesting to you? Oh, um, yeah, one of the big frustrations about um, this particular organization or brigade at uh, Gettysburg is that none of the uh, commanding officers who survived the engagement um, wrote a report that made it into the official records. And as I'm sure I probably don't need to explain what those are, 128 volumes that were put together by the U.S. War Department um, 1880s and 1890s. And even though Gettysburg is an extraordinarily well-documented battle, there's been a staggering amount written about it. Um, one of the, uh, it's very difficult uh, at the tactical level sometimes, particularly with some of the Confederate brigades to um, to find source material. And I would definitely say that was the case for, uh, for Sims's regiments. 
Um, so while there aren't surviving reports of the battle, there um, that would have been submitted within the uh, up the army chain of command that would provide a lot of the tactical details like regimental alignment and um, there are a, a small number of memoirs and diaries and individual letters written by soldiers that you can by and large piece together what, uh, what the brigade did in fighting alongside um, a number of other units, Joseph Kershaw's brigade of South Carolinians. Uh, and you can trace the movements of the brigade at least up until the last stages of the battle on July 2nd. And at that point, it gets really difficult to uh, to understand the movements of any of the units on, on in the area of the wheat field because they're all intermingled and they've all taken such heavy casualties by the time they get to across Plum Run and get to the base of uh, Little Round Top. It's even more difficult to figure out what's going on. But um, I guess the some of the letter one of the letter collections I like best is um, is a published collection by a man named William R. Stillwell. Uh, uh, Mercer University published his letters and they're outstanding. Uh, and he actually, I believe was a courier, wasn't a staff member, but a courier for General Sims and writes about helping Sims off the battlefield after he'd been wounded. Uh, so Stillwell's letters are pretty, um, are pretty vivid. And those are those and a, a number of the other sources I have, um, you know, will be reading those and talking about them on the battlefield. Yeah, no, that's awesome. So uh, as we'll move into to starting to talk more about uh, the content of the tour, definitely would like to just kind of hear your thoughts uh, on Paul Sems. Uh, he's with the brigade, I believe, starting right before the Maryland campaign. That's when they get attached to the Army of Northern Virginia. So they're um, with the Army through the winter of 62 into spring of 63. So just kind of what the state of the brigade is like um, on the dawn of the Gettysburg campaign, what they're their story is up until then. Um, Sims wasn't a professional soldier. He hadn't attended West Point or served in the army. Uh, he was a wealthy businessman and banker from uh, Columbus, a city in the southwestern part of Georgia. Uh, and while he wasn't a professional soldier, he had been intensely interested in military affairs for many years before the war uh, and was not and had commanded volunteer companies uh, and actually at the beginning of the war had been sent as an agent for the state to buy guns uh, from Northern um, manufacturers. But um, Sims's brigade, and, and so Sims began as a Colonel commanding a regiment and was promoted up to general and actually commanded um, a brigade during the seven days campaign initially um, in the summer of 1862. And they subsequently fought in the uh, Westwoods at Antietam, uh, and um, they were uh, heavily engaged at Chancellorsville on both July, uh, excuse me, May 1st, and then in the fighting at Salem Church. Mm -hmm. uh, so by the, when the brigade, which was composed of the 10th, 50th, uh, 51st, and 53rd Georgia, uh, when they entered uh, Gettysburg, um, or, 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 or entered Mayor, Pennsylvania, rather, during the campaign, uh, those men were, were seasoned veterans led by um, uh, an officer, uh, Sims, who was, who was well respected from, from what I can tell um, by his superiors. And um, of course they suffered terrible losses on the second day at Gettysburg. About a third of the brigade, I think, ended up um, being killed, wounded, or captured. Yeah, so that's you know, my next question was was going to be the million dollar question about Sems's brigade, um, where they are at Gettysburg, what's going right. through, because they have, I think they have a marker that starts out in the Rosewoods, they have one of the old, I think the War Department mm -hmm. plaques, yep. and then you had mentioned earlier, they're in the wheat field, so I think a lot of our audience is going to know, unfortunately, what that means, but I'm just curious, you know, if you sure. can kind of give us the broad overview of what sure. Gettysburg's like for them. Sure. So um, Sims's brigade is part of, as you mentioned a few mi a minute ago, the division of, of Lafayette McClaws and McClaws and Hood's divisions of Longstreet's Corps um, on July 2nd. 
uh, were given the role of trying to turn the left flank of the Union Army, which Lee, Robert E. Lee believed at the beginning of the day was located somewhere in the vicinity of uh, the Peach Orchard along the Emmitsburg Road. As we know, though, uh, that wasn't the case and that the Union line actually extended a good distance further south. And that further, and so when McClaws moved into position on Warfield Ridge in the, in the afternoon, um, he was not facing the flank of the Union Army as his superiors had hoped, but he's facing a core of the Union Army, the Third Corps under Dan Sickles, which had been Sickles on his own initiative had pushed the Third Corps far out in front of the rest of the Army, the Potomac's line. Uh, so when um, the, the Lee's hope had been that the Confederates of McClaws and Hood could turn the left or southern flank of the Union Army and roll the line up along the Emmitsburg Road. So that was the overall Confederate plan. Uh, but instead of hitting a flank, as you know, the Confederates were launching frontal attacks, Hood's troops against uh, the Devil's Den and the Round Tops, and then McClaws just north of, of Hood uh, attacked into uh, across the Emmitsburg Road. And as they moved off of Warfield, Warfield Ridge, which is where Confederate Avenue runs today, of course, um, the men in McClaws, uh, the, the, the first brigades to cross, the open fields between Warfield Ridge and the Emmitsburg Road sustained horrific casualties from a Union artillery fire from the Peach Orchard. So the Federals had amassed, as you probably know, a number of batteries there in the Peach Orchard facing south. So they were able to fire into the flanks and down the length of the line of the Confederates who were advancing. Um, and so Sims's men took very heavy casualties in the open ground getting across the Emmitsburg Road to the Rose Farm. Um, and then uh, from the, the, the area where the stone house is, they advanced into the Rose Woods and there was fighting there uh, that seesawed back and forth as Union brigades came in to reinforce the line. Um, and, uh, but ultimately the arrival of Confederate reinforcements, the last of McClaw's brigades allowed the Confederates to push through the, through the Rose Woods, through the wheat field, across Plum Run, and into that open ground at the base of uh, Little Round Top. Um, and by that point, it was close to dusk, I believe. The Confederate brigades that have been engaged were sustained terrible casualties. And the Federals, of course, were able to hold their position on round, Little Round Top and the ridge that runs north from it. And that essentially ended the day's fighting. Longstreet pulled the troops back um, uh, toward the Emmitsburg Road, um, where not all the way to the Emmitsburg Road, but, but uh, back through the wheat field. And then, uh, and then essentially the day's fighting was, was over. And so it had been an, an attempt on the part of two divisions to of, of Confederates to turn the federal left flank and while the federal lines had been pushed back <laughs> some distance at a terrific cost to both sides, at the end of the day, Longstreet's attacks had failed to break the federal line. So among the casualties that are suffered is Sims himself. And we're right. gonna go high tech here and we're gonna do the, the now famous Zoom share screen to take a quick look at um, a letter that Sems is mortally wounded, um, and he writes from his deathbed, I think in Martinsburg, down yes. in West, now West Virginia, towards yes. his wife. So I'm just wondering if you could talk, uh, if you're familiar with this, and then Sems's death or its impact, or even the letter itself. I am. Uh, so so Sims was struck in the leg, if I remember right. Uh, uh, the femoral artery uh, might have been severed. He was mortally wounded on the battlefield, but uh, he was taken off the field um, and lived long enough to make it, to accompany the Confederates south as the army retreated. And as you mentioned, uh, he eventually um, was left at, behind at a private residence in Martinsburg, Virginia, uh, with some of his staff officers present. Uh, and this uh, is a very poignant letter he wrote on the 9th 
um, uh, of uh, July, not long before his death. And, um, and it's preserved as part of a small collection of Sims's correspondence that's in the uh, Gilder Lehrman um, in New York City. They were really fortunate a few years back to uh, purchase the, this collection, I think, from descendants. Um, and so again, this is a, um, this is a, pretty, um, a pretty moving letter from someone who knows he's, um, uh, his time on this earth is short. Yeah. Um, I might um, put in a, a plug too. Hold on one second. Yeah, absolutely. We're always... Yeah, Kent, Kent Brown's book. I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, Kent Brown, Kent Masterson Brown. I had to look on the shelf of yeah. Uh, Kent Brown's book, Retreat from Gettysburg, is an excellent source, as the title implies, mm -hmm. on Lee's withdrawal from the battlefield um, back to Virginia. It's really detailed, and it's one of the best sources, I think, on Sims's um, death. He, uh, he devotes several pages to it and uh, quotes this letter as well as a couple of others. That's a good chance to make a plug that Ken Brown's going to be talking about his uh, forthcoming book ah, on uh, right. Meet at Gettysburg at this right, conference. Right. And we didn't even have to plan that. So that worked out great. Um, and sure. I believe uh, Ken Brown spoke about his retreat from Gettysburg book previously at the conference. I think so, you're right. I'm sure our audience can find that in the depths of C SPAN. Um, so, Dr. Bohannon, just kind of uh, one last question a, a new thing. Uh, at least new to me that we're going to be trying out with our, our tours this year is the battlefield, the field hospital theme. Right. So I'm just curious. Uh, I don't want to give away too many of the secrets of your tour. Uh, right. What the field hospital situation and medical kind of care scenario is going to be for Sam's Brigade. They were, um, they were taken back when the brigade retreated on July 3rd, and they even suffered some casualties on that day uh, in the retreat back toward Warfield Ridge, but the wounded eventually ended up uh, of all of Longstreet's Corps, um, or at least Hood's and McClaw's divisions, at various farms located some distance behind the uh, Confederate lines where surgeons had set up the field hospitals, um, and, uh, um, and the men who could be moved were moved when the army, who were ambulatory, were left when the army uh, retreated. But those who couldn't uh, stayed behind. Some were buried on those farms. And a number of them, uh, the structures uh, still stand for, I know the Hoods Division Hospital, and Pete has told me that McCaws, the, the, so you would have, I'm, I'm sorry, you'd have a certain farm designated as the official field hospital for um, for division in the Confederate Army. And so the buildings that served as McClaw's Division Hospital uh, are still standing. And so that's going to be one of, they're on private property. All of these um, uh, these field hospitals are, are still private or privately owned because they're quite some distance from the, the battlefield. Um, but one of the stops, the last stop on the tour after we trace the movements of Sims Brigade on the battlefield, will be to go to the farm. And I believe Pete Carmichael, the director of the CWI, knows the people who, who are there uh, or who own the property. And so we'll go there and talk about the treatment of the wounded and probably look at a few specific case studies mm -hmm. of, of soldiers to talk about their treatment, their wounds and their treatment and their ultimate fate. I mean, that'll be, I'm hoping I get to make it to the conference this summer if I can pull some strings with my CWI connections and get in sure. because the chance to see, you know, some of these places that aren't normally what's included on, on the battle walks, oftentimes, you know, you'll all get to, to walk through the, the battlefield, but the chance to, to really talk about the aftermath will be um, an interesting one and I, a, a great opportunity for this summer's conference. I also did wanted to mention too, and many of your viewers probably know this, but um, the dead from Sims Brigade were, were photographed mm -hmm. uh, on the field uh, just before burial. Uh, this was after the Confederates re had retreated and, and Northern photographers, uh, Alexander Gardner, Timothy O'Sullivan, uh, actually took a number of, of uh, grisly, uh, incredibly sad images of Confederate corpses. Um, mo most of them lined up in, uh, in, uh, for burial in the Rose Farm Undoubtedly, a lot of them are from Sims Brigade, 
And back in the 1970s, the um, photo historian William Frazanita was able to locate the exact position of where these um, photographs were taken based on some of the, the large rocks that were protruding out of the ground in the Rose Field. So um, that's one of the other places on the battlefield we'll visit. Um, it's a pasture today uh, without any trails leading through it, but we're going to get special permission to go out there and, uh, and stand on the ground where those, those photos were taken. That's awesome. I mean, I think that's uh, another really cool opportunity. I know Civil War photography is always so popular with our audience and the, the photos of Gettysburg, I think especially so because of Frazanito's book. So I think that'll be another great opportunity, another reason. I'll put a link in the description of the video so people watching it down here um, can sign up or find more information oh, okay. about the conference. So if you liked what Dr. Bohannon had to say, you want to walk uh, the in walk in the shoes of Sims Brigade at Gettysburg, uh, sign up for this summer's CWI conference. Dr. Bohannon, thank you so much for taking the time out of a monitor's busy semester uh, to talk to me. And I'm sure everyone will be looking forward to your tour. Sounds great. Wonderful. Thank you, Cameron. Take care.